Hey everyone, in our last uh, video we talked about those five limit laws. Um, and one thing about using those five limit laws is they required some uh, previous knowledge about the functions f and g that were involved. Like we already had to know uh, what those limits were or be able to find them. Um, in uh, this video I want to talk about uh, two particular uh, limit laws. They don't get any special names, um, but they're still usually referred to as limit laws. But really, two particular limits that let us create a, a large family of functions that we're often interested in, especially when combining them with uh, our first five limit laws. So I'm calling limit law number six. It's really just a statement. It says if c is a constant real number, then the limit as x approaches a of that constant c is the same as the constant itself. Remember when we were trying to find one of these limits, we're trying to figure out um, how is the output of our function behaving as the input gets closer and closer to a Remember, it doesn't care what happens necessarily at A, just what happens really, really close by. And well, if we're looking at a constant function, its output is always a constant, so the limit is going to be equal to that constant. We can kind of uh, see that graphically over here as well. Uh, on these axes, I graphed what a constant function would look like, right? If y is equal to uh, c, then y is some constant function. The graph of that is just going to give us a horizontal line. I decided to make c positive. It could be negative or zero, and that won't change the argument here. But as we get closer and closer to x equals a on either side, like we said, the output is always the same. It's always constant. So the output is always c. So the limit is going to be c as well. Uh, what I'm calling limit law number seven uh, just says the limit as x approaches a of x is equal to a. So we can uh, approach that graphically in the same way we did our constant function over here. I graphed our line y equals x, and well, what happens as x gets closer and closer to a? Well, the output we can see also gets closer and closer to the a. Uh, another way I like to think about this limit, which is kind of funny, um, so our limit's describing how a function behaves as its input approaches a. Well, in this example, or this statement, our function is the same as the input, so this is asking us what happens to x as x approaches a. We just described what happens to x as x approaches a. We just said, well, x is approaching a. So as x approaches a, x approaches a. That's all that one's really saying. And these two uh, particular limits probably seem pretty obvious, hopefully. Um, but they're really powerful because when we combine them with like the, uh, the constant multiple rule, our sum and difference rule, and in really particular our power rule, it lets us create a, a lot more functions that are much more complicated than these two. For example, if we wanted to create any polynomial, like maybe a 3x squared plus 5x minus 4, something like that, well, we could break this down into the limit uh, as x approaches a, or whatever value we want, of 3 times the function x squared plus the limit as x approaches a of 5 times the function x minus the limit as x approaches a of a constant function like 4. So basically, using these particular limits, along with our first five limit laws, allows us to uh, break down complicated functions like polynomials and rational functions and a, a good majority of our square root functions, and basically evaluate them using direct substitution. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as like uh, the combination of these first seven uh, limit laws as creating a direct substitution uh, property. And you should recognize this limit. It was showed up in a previous video. We found this uh, limit in the previous video, uh, doing it uh, kind of numerically and graphically. Uh, this time around, we're going to do it totally algebraically. So we're looking at evaluating the limit as x approaches 2 of the rational function x squared plus x minus 6 divided by x minus 2. And so in the, the last video, we talked about kind of I mentioned I referred to it as like a direct substitution property, where as long as we have a uh, functions that involve uh, powers of x and constants, we can always kind of break it down using those seven limit laws and really evaluate it just by plugging our x value in. Um, so let's go ahead and try that in this example. I'm going to go ahead and kind of skip a bunch of the, the gory steps and get right to the good stuff. All right, so going from our original statement of the limit to this new statement in blue, I've applied the uh, limit laws we've discussed so far as much as possible. So first I use the quotient limit law to think about taking the limit of the numerator and dividing that by the limit of the denominator. But I have to break down uh, both of those pieces a bit further. Going up to the numerator, our first term was x squared. So really, 
I take that limit in the numerator and break it into three limits using the sum and difference rule. Limit of the first term plus the limit of the second term minus the limit of the third term. That first term though is x squared, so I can also apply our power uh, law for limits to bring that power of two outside of the limit. And after doing that, every limit in the numerator is now either the limit of that particular function x or some constant function, in this case six. So after breaking it down like this, we'll be able to basically just plug x equals two in. And we do the same thing for the denominator. That one's a bit quicker and simpler. We break it up as the limit of the first term, the limit as x approaches two of x, and the limit as x approaches two of the constant two is what we have to subtract away from that. And so showing all this stuff might actually seem uh, unnecessary because we already know what's gonna happen. We're just gonna try to plug x equals two in. So if we do that up in the numerator, we're gonna get two squared plus the limit as x approaches two of x. Well, as x approaches two, x approaches two. We have to subtract away from that the limit of the constant six, but the limit of a constant is the constant. So that takes care of our numerator. We'll simplify that in our next step. Looking at the denominator, we have the limit as x approaches two of x. We know that's gonna be equal to two now. We subtract away from that the limit of the constant two, and the limit of the constant is the constant, so that will just be two. So now if we evaluate the uh, numerator, we get two squared, which is four, plus another two is six, minus six gives us zero. And in the denominator, we get two minus two, which is another zero. And you've probably seen it plenty in math classes, division by zero is undefined. In calculus, we're gonna pay a bit more special attention to division by zero. This is a particular case where uh, division by zero is still undefined, um, but something kind of funny goes on. Uh, this is an example of what we call an indeterminate form. We're gonna talk about these in a lot more detail later on. Uh, for now, just know that when you run into an indeterminate form, and for now that's gonna look like zero over zero, uh, we have to approach it a little bit more carefully. All right, so you may remember when we were working with this uh, function and its limit in the earlier video, uh, we simplified it. And that's what we actually wanna do here. That is gonna be the key to evaluating this function algebraically instead of numerically or graphically. And the way we simplified it was by factoring it and canceling a common factor. Remember the numerator factored as x plus three times x minus two. And the denominator is already factored. Maybe we'll just put that in a set of parentheses to see how it's gonna simplify or help us see how it's gonna simplify. Um, so let's see, we got x plus three times x minus two divided by x minus two. Now we can cancel those common factors of x minus two out. And we're going to now write this as the limit as x approaches two of the function x plus three. And so I wanna pause here for a moment to make what I think is a, a very important point about the function we started with and the function we are now working with. The idea is these two functions um, algebraically are almost the same. Uh, they only differ in one little location, right? No matter what x value you plug into this function or this function, the uh, unsimplified version or the simplified version, you're always gonna get the same output unless you plug in that limit value of two. So what that means is these functions are exactly the same everywhere except at x equals two. We're trying to find the limit of our function at x equals two. Um, but if you remember what I said in some of the previous videos, and I try to emphasize this a lot, the limit doesn't care what happens at the x value of interest. It only cares what happens really, really close by. And this is where that becomes really important because, well, these functions aren't the same function at x equals two but they're the same function everywhere else. But like we said, the limit doesn't care what happens at x equals two. So the fact that these are different at x equals two doesn't care or doesn't matter to the limit. The limit only cares about what happens really close by and really close by, these things are identical. You can't even tell the difference between the two. So because of that, we can look at the simpler function and its limit instead to find the limit as x approaches two of x plus three. We could break it up and use the sum and difference rule, but we can kind of see where it's going. We're just gonna plug in x equals two. That gives us two plus three, and our final limit value 
of 5. And we can actually kind of uh, summarize this example or generalize it to create a little theorem or another limit law. We usually call that, or people give it different names, but I always refer to this limit law as like uh, the equivalent function theorem or the equivalent function limit law. Let me go ahead and write that up for us. All right, so here I have that uh, theorem written up. I'm calling it the equivalent function theorem. It says if you have two functions, f and g, they're equal everywhere or equal for all x values except maybe one at x equals a, then the limit as x approaches a of our first function f is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches a of our second function g, provided this limit exists. And the idea of when we apply this equivalent function theorem is in an example like this one right here, where maybe one of these functions limits is much easier to find. Maybe we can actually find one of them by direct substitution. If that's the case and our equivalent function theorem applies, then we get the other, uh, the other limit for free.